Greetings. On this channel, we like exponential charts that depict technological trends, including the lesser known exponential trends. And today we're going to look at a chart about something that many people are curious about, but rarely is a chart tracking this particular aspect of exponential technological progress actually made. So we have futuretimeline.net to thank for this chart. And this is a chart of global average internet speeds, 1990 to present. And this chart, like so, indicates the trend line with the blue line up to present. And this is very well sourced. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you see the footnotes that begin with data points in 1991, as well as 1995, 96, 97, and so forth. So there's a lot of data points along the trend. It is not a chart that can be accused of having too few data points and force fitting an exponential trend into too few data points. Now we see the history of the internet within even the ebbs and flows of this chart. Before 1995, there wasn't a World Wide Web through a graphical interface that most of us are used to. And then when that graphical user interface began, then worldwide internet usage rose and a lot of websites were created in response. And then the notion of buying and selling things over the internet arose, but people were doing that very little. Even during the dot-com bubble of 98, 99, 2000, actually using the internet to buy things was a very small fraction of what people did relative to today. And most people did not have internet in their homes. And even if they did, they had something called dial-up connections. Because people had landline phones, their internet access was through a modem that was through their landline and called dial-up. You would actually hear a dialing process in accessing your internet then, if you remember. And that had speeds in the kilobits per second. When broadband became available, and it was still expensive as of 2001, 2002, most people did not have what was called broadband in their homes. There were two types of broadband, something called DSL and cable. And what was considered broadband was 1.44 megabits per second. And the United States was a laggard in this broadband adoption phase because the US has lower population density than South Korea, Japan, etc. So people started to adopt broadband from 2002 up to 2005 or six. And that's when broadband started to get mainstream. 1.44 megabits per second became relatively normal and Wi-Fi hotspots started to spread. I actually worked at Netgear during this time, 2002 to 2009 and Wi-Fi hotspots in the home were all the rage because before you just had dial up internet, but now everyone in the household could access the internet wirelessly because laptops were also becoming commoditized by that time. The internet was not just one PC in the home, which happened to be a desktop, which people had to take turns sharing. And as speeds rose, other things began to happen, such as wireless data over smartphones and things like that. And in the United States, broadband speeds did not rise as quickly as people had hoped because companies like Comcast had a lot of market share, not a monopoly, but at least too much of a market share that they faced any competitive pressure. And as you can see here, the steep rise until 2010 started to fall away from the trend line. Now, why was this happening? Well, as we have seen from other videos on this channel, Computing speeds also began to fall away from their long-term trend line around 2013 or so. And computational speed is a function of broadband speed because you still need processing power to do things like encoding, decoding, and so forth. And while more and more innovation in broadband delivery technologies is trying to de-emphasize the importance of processing speed in this delivery, it's still an important aspect of delivery. So the decline in the upward trajectory of broadband speeds is attributable to the decline in the upward trajectory of computational speeds. Now for a bit more detail on that, we're going to go to a vignette from another video on this channel. So we'll go and look at that for a bit. And as you can see, the green line is flattening. It was moving at a nice logarithmic rate, about 10x every four years, until 2012 or 13 or so, and then started to flatten and has continued to remain on this flatter, less impressive trajectory. Now, if you scroll down, they have the same chart with a trend line in it, and it charts just a basic Excel style trend line between all three lines. And the sum of the top 500 supercomputers power is thus charted in this trend line. And you can see it was above this trend line, but because of the underperformance since 2013 or so, the trend line itself is moving down. But I say that is validating the lower performance and that should not 
in fact be the type of trend line they represent. They should have represented the original trend line and underperformance from that. And I'll tell you why. The paradigm of computing that was represented in the old generation, Moore's Law specifically, which stipulated that transistor size shrinks every 18 months or so. Some versions of it say every two years, some versions say every 18 months, I'll go with 18 months. And therefore you can cram more and more transistors per unit area to increase computing power. And that worked until 2012 or 13. And here's what has happened, ironically. Once that paradigm began to saturate because they could not shrink transistors anymore, each doubling, each incremental unit of gain became slower and slower and slower. And therefore, I have created my own chart over here. The interesting thing is that Ray Kurzweil, he actually said that, yeah, Moore's Law will saturate by a certain time and it will get flatter and flatter. But what he thought would happen is that a new paradigm of computing would come in right away and there would be no time lost. When in fact, that has not happened. And what is occurring now is I have put this green line to show the pre-flattening trend line and where we should be just to maintain this trend line. And this trend line is not just for computing. It goes back through all of economics evolution and everything, as you can see through many videos on this channel. And it has centuries of data behind it in an economic sense and billions of years of data behind it in an evolutionary and paleontological sense. But this area of underperformance is what we want to look at because it's not just that the line is behind the trend line, but the area enclosed by the underperformance is a representation of how much pressure there is to revert back to the trend line. And the pressure is pretty large because as you can see over here, to get back to the trend line by 2025, we are going to need over a 100x gain in computing power in what is now just three years because we're already into 2022. More realistically, by 2029 to revert back to the trend line, we would need a 1000x gain in computing power just to intercept the trend line in 2029, seven years from now. And that is not going to happen with the existing paradigm and existing architecture of computing because the energy consumption is prohibitive. The distance that information has to travel is prohibitive towards speed increases. You have to have much greater integration of all the components of computing and therefore shorter circuitry distances and so forth. And the company that figures this out is going to achieve a very, very high valuation in an extremely short time, simply because they are fixing a problem that is bottlenecking every other type of technological progress. So as you can see, even though supercomputing has seemingly nothing to do with broadband speeds, supercomputing power progression is a function of the progression of all computing power, which then governs the advance of almost every other type of exponential technology, including broadband speeds. Now, with something like Starlink, delivered by Elon Musk's SpaceX company, the internet speeds available are 200 megabits per second or more, and eventually their goal is to get to one gigabit per second, probably in accordance with this red trend line over here. Now, if the next generation of computing architecture were to be commercialized, then we might revert back to the trend line that we saw before 2010, allowing one gigabit per second to happen even faster. But that is something that even Elon Musk is not directly working on. That has to flow from the computing industry and has to appear in supercomputing first. We are missing out on a lot of modern applications that should have been here by now, 2022, had we stayed on this trend line. George Gilder wrote an ambitious book in 2000 called Telecosm that predicted all types of things on account of very high bandwidth that would arrive by the 2020s. And I've done a review of that book on this channel as well. And you can view that video by following the link in the upper right hand corner over here. But until this computing architecture bottleneck is corrected and we revert back to the trend line, bandwidth will also be lagging its full potential because we ought to be about 10x higher than than where we are now and all types of advanced applications that were expected by the 2020s are not here yet as a result. But nonetheless, this is an exponential trend which supports our case of a technological singularity occurring in the 2060s as per my recent estimate and big jumps in bandwidth speed which lead to greater collaboration and greater integration economically of other parts of the world are in fact a stepping stone to that. And those who are really interested in this subject should read all the footnote links in this website below. And this website will be in the description box below as well. 
But yes, bandwidth is also an exponential technology and has to be viewed worldwide because the worldwide average is the only thing that matters as with all technology. Anyway, I hope you found this video to be informative and if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much for watching.